Uh, hello everyone. The previous videos that we've put up uh, for this class were based on Greek philosophy. So we looked at the pre-Socratics, then Socrates, then Plato, then Aristotle. But now we'd like to try and move, uh, take a, a big leap forward actually, and start to consider some of the modern philosophers. Uh, before we do that, I want to try and fill the gap a little bit. I mean, it's a huge span of time between the Greeks and the, the early moderns and these the transitions that we're talking about in this particular video. But I think it helps frame a little bit what was taking place in the, the medieval world and then uh, what's going to be taking place in the modern era and the changes that uh, occur that that bring us into the modern era or you know characteristics of what the modern era actually is so these three i mean i have emblems for each of the transitions on the left is uh, a picture called the Vitruvian Man, that's from uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So that represents the Renaissance. On the right, we have uh, Martin Luther, and he represents uh, the Protestant Reformation. In the center, we have Galileo, uh, who represents for us, I mean, the scientific revolution. So those three transitional movements, I mean, in history, bring us to the verge of modernity. And we want to try and look at them and see philosophically what each of them contributes uh, trying to go forward. So one of the things that happens at the, the end of the ancient period of history, or the, the time of the, the Greeks and then the Romans, was the, the rise of Christianity. So you, we could say that if uh, the fall of Rome is usually dated about 476 AD, and by that time Christianity has already uh, gradually become a, a powerful religious force in, in the Mediterranean, in Eastern Mediterranean uh, part of the world. So the it, the period of history that follows the, the fall of the Roman Empire, we refer to that as the, the medieval era. And the medieval area, era, I mean, extends all the way from the fall of Rome to maybe uh, like the 14th century, 13th or the 14th century, before the beginnings of, of modern uh, viewpoints begin to make themselves felt. With uh, so throughout the medieval world, Christianity is has become the dominant religion in the, in that world, in centered in European, say Western Europe, primarily. And uh, you could say that the whole medieval period is dominated by what I'm going to refer to as a God-centered mindset. And then that's a, an interesting characteristic of this era I, because I, it says a lot about how people saw themselves and saw the world that they lived in. And then especially as a result of these transitions we're going to look at, by the time we get into the modern era of history, that mindset is shifted and becomes more of a human-centered uh, mindset. So that's one of the prominent transitions that we want to take a look at. Throughout the mid medieval world, you say Christianity is probably the most uh, powerful institution uh, that existed. There were also uh, secular lords, I mean, aristocracy, nobility, and so forth. And uh, they also 
had power, but they they shared it with the the church. I mean, so those are the two primary power bases: that of the spiritual lords representing Christianity, and the secular lords representing the, the aristocracy. In this God-centered era, you could say that all significant endeavors were for the greater glory of God. So not for the sake of the individual self would you undertake uh, projects or uh, other things that you were trying to accomplish, but everything would be dedicated to the greater glory of God artworks, building projects, military conquest, you could say the crusades, pilgrimages. People were burdened uh, with a, a pretty dark view of what it meant to be a human being. If you compared yourself uh, against the, the perfection of God, who uh, was always ever present, individual humans came off as pretty lowly creatures and did not count for very much. Human beings had, uh, you know, com again compared to God, had finite existences, uh, limited capabilities, and uh, were viewed as being inclined towards sin. You'd say this earliest stage of the medieval world was referred to as the Dark Ages. So it was a period after the fall of Rome and kind of the disintegration of uh, the, the Roman Empire. Let's say the, the social and political life devolved into what we call the, the feudal system. So for most people, that was a pretty dark period, you know, and uh, I mean exteriorly and also interiorly, and uh, pretty bleak. If we consider something like pride, for instance, uh, during the, the medieval era, pride was considered one of the seven deadly sins. I think all of the, the seven deadly sins were based on the idea of too much of the self is involved and it's like turning towards yourself instead of turning toward God. So turning away from God was considered a sin and pride was one of the ways you might be too focused on yourself. The preferred virtue was therefore humility and uh, not to put yourself forward. Most artists during the, the medieval era didn't even sign their names to the, their creations. The idea was that uh, whatever it was you were trying to accomplish, accomplish, you would do so I mean, to, to be of service to God, not to be of service to yourself. So that's part of the mindset that uh, weighed down on people, I would say. Uh, another symbol of the, the, the role in, that religion played in the lives of people were the, the great Gothic cathedrals, which were built really uh, more towards the, the latter parts of the, the medieval period. But the great Gothic cathedrals, they, you can say they dominated the landscape much in the same way as religion did. The cathedrals were religious institutions, religious, you know, architecture uh, meant to, for the, the worship of God. But they, you know, if you think about here in our own little Pittsburgh, for instance, the Consider how the, the Cathedral of Learning in Oakland, how it dominates uh, its surroundings. And uh, you can see it from, uh, from far away, actually. So you could say so with religion in the lives of people of the era. And religion was at the center of everything. And kind of 
dominated uh, their landscape. From, you know, you'd be born, you know, baptized in the church, married in the church, uh, and buried in, in the church as well. So the whole of your life would be, uh, have a religious background for it. If we consider what the, the state of affairs uh, was in, in the field of philosophy, we could say that throughout the medieval era, uh, philosophy did persist and uh, in certain respects thrived, uh, but it was heavily influenced by Christian theology. All of the, the major philosophers during the period were Christians. And that pretty much started with uh, almost at the beginning of the medieval era with uh, the, the philosopher slash Saint Augustine and uh, uh, who, who lived in the fourth, fifth century uh, and was alive or died, you know, roughly around the same time that the Roman Empire collapsed. Augustine was very much uh, inspired by the philosophy of Plato and gave Christi Christianity a kind of Christian reading of Plato. Augustine saw Plato as providing a kind of intellectual framework or justification of, of Christian belief. So that was a, a strong influence throughout the period towards getting towards the latter part of the medieval era. Another famous uh, philosopher slash uh, saint Aquinas uh, near the end of the period, let's say like 13th century, was intrigued and inspired by the philosophy of Aristotle and gave uh, Christianity and, and the world, uh, a, a Christian reading of Aristotle. Uh, so the, the end result of these two thinkers in particular gave, gave us a kind of blend of Greek philosophy uh, with Christian theology, which was a pretty powerful mix, which we still feel the, the effects of even today. I would say, and uh, in their minds, uh, faith and reason were not in competition with each other, but they actually complemented each other in, in the life of a, an individual human being. So uh, they, didn't, they didn't compete exactly that both of them were ways of approaching uh, the truth. And ultimately, the thought was that there's only one truth, and that's God truth. And reason is a legitimate path to it. And faith is also a legitimate path to it. Faith, be, faith in the divine revelations, such as uh, in the Bible. So in the minds, you know, you would say Augustine and Aquinas made significant contributions in the field of philosophy that were strictly philosophical, but uh, faith is always in the background, and you could say that faith always had the last word when it came to uh, determining what is. In the, the field of science, we could say that science also persisted scientific uh, endeavors work uh, but it was still dominated by Aristotle's foundations in the sciences Aristotle's way of doing science were still was still the the model for uh, medieval scientists I mean to continue their work you could say that that meant working with his uh, four causes and assuming that everything had a everything had a final cause uh, or a telos and say that was uh, Aristotle assumed a teleological view of the natural world and that everything uh, 
All things had purposes built into their natures, which determined what their purpose was, or what their function was, or what their, their end was, what they aimed at. So that was still uh, a kind of guideline for people who were interested in pursuing the natural sciences. The other thing that, I won't say it came from Aristotle, but he contributed to it, was the this geocentric view of the world in, in which the earth was at the center of everything. And uh, surrounding the earth, you would have, I, mean, I think in Aristotle, the four elements, you know, earth would be the the material earth would be at the center of everything and then water and then air and then fire and then the heavens, the ether uh, above that and uh, even the heavenly bodies rotated in their perfectly circular patterns in accordance with what people, the way people wanted to think that the uh, everything was arranged. So this geocentric view sort of being locked into this uh, feeling that you had to identify purposes for everything that you were studying were two of the, the uh, principles that kind of held back science in a way. I mean, during this time period, we'll see that when we go forward, uh, Scientists are going to have to liberate themselves from these ways of seeing things. So all of this that we've presented so far just provides us with a glimpse of how the world was viewed during the, the medieval time. And we'll see that gradually it's going to morph into the, the modern era. Our primary goal in this uh, video is to talk about those transitional developments and we're referring to the, the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation and the scientific uh, revolution. So the, the traditional authorities in both religion and science will be challenged uh, as a result of these transitions and a new mindset will begin to emerge for uh, Western peoples. So we're going to start with uh, the Renaissance, uh, a real period of uh, flourishing, I think, with in respect to the the arts in particular. Some of the most famous, and like uh, depicted, some of the most famous works of art that come from this era and uh, it's amazing that this is uh, back in the 14th 15th century uh, but we're still all these images are still familiar to us because there's so such significant contributions to the art of, in our history on the top left we is just a, a detail from the last supper by Leonardo da Vinci. In the center, also the, the Mona Lisa by da Vinci as well. On the, the bottom left, uh, I think we use this in our Aristotle uh, presentation. You have uh, Michelangelo's statue of the biblical figure David. On the top right, we also have a detail from the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling in the, the Vatican that Michelangelo painted in uh, depicting kind of the creation of, of uh, human beings by, by God. That's a, a very interesting image, you know, it's sort of, it's layered with meaning in, in my view. And uh, you see God reaching out to man and man kind of half-heartedly trying to reach back. Uh, in the, the bottom right, 
uh, we have uh, another picture that we used earlier, uh, which is the, the School of Athens, Athens by Raphael. So these are very significant uh, contributions in the world of art uh, were made during this time period. But it was more than just uh, art for this era. So the, uh, the Renaissance, and uh, you say location-wise, primarily in Italy, in the south of Europe. And you'd say time-wise includes uh, 15th and the 16th century. Literally, Renaissance is a rebirth, and we say in this case. It is a kind of rebirth, uh, you know, it's kind of life coming back into the medieval era. But it's, it's also a rebirth of the classical ideals that were characteristic of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. So the, in Italy in particular, there was kind of nostalgia for the grandeur of these great civilizations in the past. And there were a lot of reminders of those civilizations because there were ruins everywhere uh, that still remained from them. But there was a kind, you know, kind of longing for once again that type of society and a, a renewed interest in the art and, and the philosophy uh, of the, the ancients. These two cultures, the, the Romans and the, the Greeks, were very much human-centered cultures. You'd say they also had their religions, but they were very different from the religion of Christianity. Their gods were always were, were human-like, not like the, the Christian god, sort of remote and like a kind of ideal. But uh, the Greeks and the Romans had gods that were like hum humans, except stronger and longer lived. They were immortal. And they were far from morally perfect. So it made it a little easier to be a human being in that time period. I mean, you didn't have, if you measured yourself against the gods, it wasn't the same as trying to measure yourself against the Christian God. So that was kind of uh, some liberating aspect to that way of seeing religion. So with the, in the Renaissance, we see a, a renewed interest in what it means to be a human being. We could say that's... Uh, a return to humanism in a way. And there was the, the feeling that each individual human being had a kind of inestimable worth or value, that each individual human being had a kind of dignity contained within his, his, own, his or her own self. And one of the, the key elements of that was uh, the fact that each person had a rational capacity. So this enabled us, you know, a more positive feeling about what it meant to be a human being. You didn't have to think of yourself as a, something lowly or inclined towards sin necessarily. But although that still might be an aspect of things, but human beings had a lot of positive uh, qualities. And we see in the Renaissance even a kind of celebration of uh, the, the individual uh, was included in, in the way people saw things. If we look at the artists, for instance, uh, in the Renaissance, uh, uh, at least some of them were familiar with the big names, but there were some really bigger than life figures and who were clearly proud of their achievements and also ambitious. Uh, they promoted themselves even. So we see this shift in terms of uh, virtue 
where now pride is okay. It's not one of the seven deadly sins so much. And you don't have to be unduly humble in, you know, when it comes to taking credit for your achievements. So pride instead of humility. Christianity is still everywhere uh, in the, the in this world. But there's a, a new way of thinking about what it means to be a human being. A new mindset has emerged already. And a mindset that doesn't weigh down on people so much. There's still a lot of religious art, clearly, in the world of art. But also human art, art depicting ordinary humans. What's telling that a lot of the Renaissance painters and sculptors uh, created nude figures, painted and sculpted them. And this, this didn't happen so much in the medieval world where human figures are always fully clothed all the time and kind of the depictions of them were highly stylized. But in the Renaissance, you get a lot of pictures of nude figures and it sort of indicates that uh, the human body is seen as something which is beautiful in itself and not uh, a source of sinfulness not something to be hidden away necessarily or ashamed of so that's a very different attitude about even the outer form of human beings Uh, then we wanted to move on into the Protestant Reformation, and on this uh, entry slide, I've put up some images of that era. And so on the left is uh, probably the most significant figure, and that's Martin Luther. Uh, I've heard it said, you know, and people who have great man sort of interpretations of history that it's rarely the case that a single person really creates a lot of uh, changes but i think in a crash course video uh, it's said that that doesn't seem to be the case that martin luther really was a a mover in, in terms of getting the, the protestant reformation moving so that's him on the left uh in the center is an a symbol that he adopted, uh, kind of rose with a heart and a, a cross uh, in the center, which represents for him and it, for, he, you know, what he believed, you know, about religion, what was necessary. On the the right is a printing press, which was so significant in in Luther's. Uh, becoming a, a really significant figure is that uh, the, the things that he wrote, uh, the pamphlets, and probably most significantly his translation of the Bible, the fact that they could be printed and widely distributed uh, was a, a huge contribution to the movement. Uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, took place in the north of Europe was that the Renaissance was centrally focused in the south. The Protestant Reformation is in the north. Uh, I think it begins in Germany. And famously, Martin Luther in 1517 posted his objections to the abuses of the uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, in particular, their selling of indulgences. So Luther in 1517 posts a list of his objections to church practices on the door of a church in Wittenberg. And he's inviting a discussion or reconsideration of some of these practices. So initially he just wanted to, to reform the church and the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, not replace it. Luther himself was a, a monk, an Augustinian monk, and uh, was dedicated to the church, but he had his ideas about how the church, what the church should be and what it should represent. And he was a bit of a purist, and he was put off by 
what was going on in the, the Roman Catholic Church at the time. You consider the Roman Catholic, this is 1517, the Roman Catholic Church had probably been uh, in the, the dominant church, or really the, the only, in the European theater at least, was a, the, the supreme authority on religious questions from uh, for like a, over a thousand years at this point already. So too much power uh, creates conditions where kind of abuses are are more tempting for people, and the church had become pretty corrupt at, at this time period. So Luther sought reform. So he got his day in court, I mean, uh, but it was uh, quickly became apparent to him that the church wasn't willing to make any reforms. And instead, uh, uh, Luther was rejected. So this kind of forced him to separate from the Roman Catholic Church and sort of start his own uh, religious uh, group, which you know, clearly was Lutheranism. This is the, the first step in the, the beginning, uh, in the rise of Protestantism, this protest movement, which quickly spread across Northern Europe uh, in particular, through the Scandinavian countries and into England as well. So it's primarily a religious movement or a religious reform movement, but uh, the, some of the philosophical I ideas that we spoke about in the Renaissance are also play a significant role in this, and it's also it's going to be humanism again, focus on individual human beings and their capabilities uh, are going to come to the focus. Luther is really. One of the things you could say is that he's what he's doing is he's really challenging the role of the church in the life of uh, any Christian. So the the Roman Catholics had this uh, assumed that the church had a, a specific role in the life of in, in Christians. We'll, we'll talk about that on the next slide. The traditional Roman Catholic Church saw its role as an intermediary between God and ordinary Christians. The, the members of the church, the people, were expected to relate to God through relating to the church. You could say the church assumed this role after Jesus was gone. So and you could say just like Jesus was a kind of intermediary between God and ordinary human beings, you could say that God was a kind of, Jesus was a um, kind of intercessor be, because in his very nature Jesus was both human and divine at the same time. He provided uh, a way for humans to be linked with God through through him. So when Jesus was gone, the church assumed that role of intercessor. Uh, and the church, when it took on this role of intercessor, intermediary between God and ordinary human beings, it, is, it had teaching authority, so it taught people what the doctrines were and what, how they should worship and all that stuff. It, it provided forgiveness of sins. It took confessions uh, and things like that. So this was kind of, uh, you would have a relationship with God, but it would be through your relationship with the church, kind of indirect relationship with God, a direct relationship with the church. Luther really had a different vision of what the role the church should be, and he believed that individuals could have more of a direct and personal relationship with God, and it didn't have to be through the church. They didn't, they didn't have to go through 
and intermediary. Luther's goal was facilitated when he translated the Bible into the German vernacular. Unlike the academic Latin translations uh, that the, the Roman church used, uh, you had to know Latin in order to read the Bible, and the only people who knew Latin were people who were in the church, monks, and so forth. So ordinary people couldn't read the Bible for themselves. They had to rely on the church to explain it to them. But when Luther's translation of the Bible into a, a common language that people could read, and also the, the invention of the printing press, which made this translation readily available to large numbers of people, that <clears throat> excuse me, that people could read and decide for themselves what God required of them. This is, corresponds with the humanistic uh, humanism that we referred to earlier. The idea that each individual person has within himself the ability to, to read and to understand and decide for himself uh, what the Bible sort of tells him about how, what his religious practices should be. So everyone, each individual person, has this rational capacity, and this rational capacity gives each individual kind of dignity within themselves that ultimately requires respect of uh, each individual as well. So people didn't really need the higher authority of the church in order to instruct them as to how to worship. Really, all they needed was uh, to read for themselves, and ultimately, just all they needed was faith uh, by itself. As uh, one of the videos indicated, sola fide was the expression. And the invention of the printing press made this uh, possible you know in the, the medieval earlier medieval world there there wasn't much literacy and the church could occupy a more authoritative position in the life of people because people couldn't read the bible for themselves uh, but now moving into the modern era this is possible and it changes the, the nature of religion a great deal the last stage or the last transition that we wanted to look at of the three is the, the scientific revolution. It's a little bit later, but and the changes occur maybe gradually. But really we've we've looked at the Renaissance and saw the kinds of changes that the Renaissance brought in the way people thought about things. And then the Protestant Reformation also changed the way people thought about religion and uh, then in science there's gradually people are coming up with new ways of, of doing science on this uh, intro slide I've included three of the most famous kind of in order I think Galileo Copernicus and Newton then I've included, you know, the, the one video that we looked at on the, the scientific revolution used this quote, which is a famous quote from Einstein, you know, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. And these are three of the giants that Einstein would be referring to, scientists that preceded him and sort of made it possible for, for him to achieve uh, the level of insight and understanding that, that he was able to get to. As we discussed earlier, uh, this revolution, the scientific revolution, and contributions of Galileo, Copernicus, and ultimately Newton, were based on challenging and overthrowing the traditional authority uh, up to this time period in, in terms of how to do science, and that was Aristotle. 
That meant that Aristotle's insistence on identifying final causes, uh, which meant identifying purposes natural, which are built in to things, was replaced by, again, this is Aristotle's terminology, but what Aristotle referred to as efficient causes. If you remember, efficient causes were more focused on trying to explain how something how something came into existence, uh, kind of in a direct uh, kind of connection. What brought something actually into existence? Trying to understand that. And didn't involve any assumption that there were purposes in terms of how things came about or what the end result was. So that was one major element that 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 the modern scientist uh, or the scientists of the of this period had to overcome, and uh, pretty quickly I think they did. The other assumption was this represented by the the, the geocentric vision of our solar system, which we said was endorsed by. Aristotle, also by Ptolemy, was ultimately overthrown by Copernicus with his heliocentric uh, version of uh, the solar system. We call this the Copernican Revolution. And this was also a, a major shift. It was really a way of turning things upside down in terms of how we saw our place in the in the greater cosmos or in a greater world. And this shift would have significant consequences not only in science but also uh, in the field of religion as well. So Copernicus's uh, revolution, you could say, in the, the field of astronomy uh, really kind of turn things uh, upside down in a way. And if we say, if you can have a revolution, there has to be an, an old theory which is replaced by a new theory. So if we, we start, we take a look at the old theory. And we've already said that that was the geocentric theory, with the idea being that the Earth is at the center of everything. And everything else revolves around the earth, the planets, uh, the sun, the moon, stars, and the more distant heavenly bodies. And this was, we said, endorsed by Aristotle Ptolemy and also by the, the Roman Catholic Church because this theory supported the Christian creation story and placed the earth and mankind even at the very center of everything that existed and that seemed to correspond with the idea that God had created everything and put human beings right in the middle of his creation. Yes, you know, common sense or the appearances of things supported this theory as well because it's certainly when we uh, in our ordinary experience, we, we see that the sun rises uh, in the morning and sort of reaches a midpoint, and then it sets in the evening. It looks as though we're standing still, and the sun is moving around us, and so at least we have that appearance. And likewise with the moon, we follow the path of the moon as it sort of... Uh, comes up on one horizon, goes across the sky, and comes down on the other horizon. It looks like the moon is revolving around us. If we consider now in the, the light of a better understanding, we see that it's not so much that the, the sun and the moon are moving around us, but it's more the case that we, as the observers on the earth, are moving with respect to those heavenly bodies. And so the earth is constantly rotating on its axis. So when the sun rises, it's really the earth moving, rotating towards the sun.
So Copernicus's new theory sort of took this into account. And we said his new theory was the heliocentric theory. And it assumed instead of the Earth being at the middle of everything, the Sun was at the middle of everything. And uh, this view was instantly rejected by the church without really very much consideration, I would say. There wasn't any openness to the church adapting its views to newfound uh, discoveries in the field of science. So the church felt that this was a harmful theory you know, because it, it conflicted with what the church had traditionally believed, church dogma. And it really, it actually displaced the earth. Not only were human beings and the earth not at the center, but actually they were far from the center. And this was troubling uh, to the to the church, and they had a hard time accepting it. So the church was resistant to this new theory; didn't want to accept it. And the only problem was that, uh, which is a big problem, that Copernicus, with the the help of the newly developed telescope uh, provided by Galileo could demonstrate or could show that his view was correct that uh, and that you know if you wanted to assume that the earth was the center of everything you couldn't it couldn't be held up by direct observation so that was one thing that Copernicus could provide evidence for his theory. Furthermore, when Copernicus established this theory and he took into account the movement of the observer, it made a, a big difference in how you understood what it was you were actually seeing when you looked into the, the sky, into the night sky. If you're trying to understand the movements of the heavenly bodies, what you're trying to study and make sense out of and so forth you can make much better sense out of their movements if you take into account the fact that you the observer are moving uh, in, with respect to them as you observe them you take your own movement into account you get a better understanding of how things actually move on their own so the theory, there are a strong arguments for accepting the theory, but the church continued to reject it. Uh, they kind of punished people like Galileo, placed him under house arrest for the remainder of his life and so forth. Uh, and the church effectively dragged its feet. Sorry for the misspelling here. And dragging the, its feet, it lost credibility in the fields of science and philosophical thinkers. And uh, so it sort of damaged uh, the church's position ultimately by refusing to accept what it looked like there was sound evidence that they should, they should accept. So from going forward then, now, the science and religion could no longer be seen as complements of each other because it looked like uh, they gave opposing views of what, uh, what the true nature of reality was. So instead of complementing each other, now they came into conflict. You had the religious explanation of the world and a scientific explanation of the world and they said very different things this is really uh, another sign of what's going to happen in the modern world <laughs>